You're sitting in your prison cell. It's barely 6 a.m. The rooster just crowed for the second time, and the Roman guards haven't even brought your morning slop yet. But you hear a commotion down the hall. What's anyone doing up at this hour? You hear the buzz of dozens of people filing into the courtroom, and you can tell by the tone of their voices, they want blood. You panic. Your trial isn't until tomorrow, right? Did you lose track of the day? Isn't today Friday? Have they come early? And then you hear a booming voice. All rise for the honorable Pilate, procurator of Rome, loyal servant of Caesar, who will oversee today's proceedings between the chief priest and the rabble rouser that they call the king of the Jews. Council member Caiaphas, you may make your opening statement. Your Honor, we humble Jews have done our best to live peaceably under Rome, continuing the traditions of our fathers while honoring the emperor. This vile man who is before you shows no respect for our traditions, blaspheming the name of our God and leading many to follow after him in his irreverent ways. Furthermore, his sedition threatens the peace of our state, opposing the very emperor by calling himself a king and amassing a large following. He is no king of Rome, and we assure you, he is no king of ours. To maintain the peace, to discourage any more from following him, we recommend and request the swiftest of actions, immediate death by crucifixion. From your cell, you hear Pilate interject. Uh, excuse me, priest, did you say death? You know I'll need to interrogate him myself, and the paperwork will be a nightmare. Are you sure this can't be resolved with a public scourging? Your Honor, would we have brought someone to you for death if he were not completely guilty? We say, talk to him. So this Friday, Good Friday, we're going to be gathering at home gatherings all over the shore. We're going to be unpacking the events of that day. But first, this morning, friends, I want to say to you, TGIF. Thank God it's Friday. And so this morning, we're going to see why this Friday is so good with how it gets started. So let me read to you all 15 verses. Let's read the story, and then we'll go back through it and break it down. Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 1. This is God's word for East Point Church. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. And the chief priest accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. But the chief priest, they stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Father in heaven, we pray that you would open our eyes that we may behold wonderful things from your word. Speak to us, God. Teach us about you. Teach us about ourselves and change us in the process. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go back to the beginning of the story. Here's how Good Friday gets started. It says, and as soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. So they're all there. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. 
And the chief priest accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. First thing we see here, Jesus' opponents accuse, but Jesus refuses to defend. To understand this scene, you got to understand that Israel, the religious leaders, they have no real authority here. Okay, they, they live under Roman occupation. And so Rome has given them some religious autonomy. Rome has allowed Israel to kind of govern their own traditions and religion and practice, but they really have no authority to govern, let alone execute someone. Okay, like imagine if the police came to East Point Church and we executed somebody in our church. It got weird. Bear with me though, okay? We executed somebody in our church a ministry partner, and when the police asked, why did you do that? We said, hey, stay out of this church discipline. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. You have no authority to make those kinds of decisions. In the same way, Israel had no authority to execute someone. So they have to drag him to Pilate and convince the governor of Rome, this man is worthy of execution. We think this guy's a big problem. You should kill him. All right, so that's what they have to do. So what do they do? They, they, first thing in the morning, they bind him as if he's a dangerous prisoner. They drag him, right? So that should send a message. This guy's dangerous. It says they accuse him of many things. The list of their accusations is long, but notice the summary of their accusations. And we hear it from the lips of Pilate. Notice the summary. Notice the angle that they're going to take here to try to convince Rome to kill him. They call him the king of the Jews. Now, again, I just told you, Rome has given Israel some religious leash. But there's one thing that there's no tolerance for. There's one thing, zero tolerance in Rome, and it is this, freedom fighters. Israel, we're going to let you govern your religion, but if we hear the slightest hint, if we hear the slightest whisper of an insurrection, of somebody trying to overthrow Rome, you will be crushed. And so they use this moniker, King of the Jews, not only to mock him, like, yeah, he calls himself a king, that's rich. They're mocking him, but what else are they doing? They're trying to get Pilate's attention. They're trying to cast Jesus as an agitator. Hey, Pilate, I don't know, but how would your boss, how would Caesar feel about a man who's claiming to be a king, who's amassing a large following? How how is Caesar going to feel when there's an insurrection under your watch? I don't know, Pilate. I'm just saying that's your head on the platter. You might want to deal with this threat. You might want to take care of this dude. There's an uprising, Pilate. I'm telling you. So that gets Pilate's attention. So what does he do? It says he drags him away and he interrogates him. He sits down with Jesus one-on-one and he says point blank, Are you the king of the Jews? Now, let's call a timeout here, all right? If you got an opportunity to explain yourself, if you got an opportunity to sit before the judge, right, to answer for your accusations, and he asks you point blank, are you guilty? This is your moment, okay? If you have a chance to sit with the judge, did you do it? Explain yourself. This is your sign, all right? So if somebody comes to you and says, Bob, They're calling you the murderer. Are you the murderer? Let's come up with some good answers here, okay? No. That might be a great way to defend yourself, right? You might try a, whoa, this is a misunderstanding, right? What had happened was we got into a fight. There's so many ways you can explain and defend yourself. Here are some answers that don't make the list. Are you the murderer? That's what they're saying. Uh, that's not, are you the murderer? You said it, not me. Are you the murderer? What, what, this is your chance? Defend yourself, rise up and explain. Are you guilty? No. And that that's exactly what Jesus says. Are you guilty? Are you the king of the Jews? You said so. You got, that's what you guys are calling me. Jesus makes no move to defend himself. And Pilate, this guy is shook right now. He is shocked. He says, he says here, he goes, have, have you no answer to make? 
He, he's literally trying to coach Jesus up. He's, he's so perplexed. He's like, no, 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 this, this, is your, this is your moment. This is where you defend yourself. Like, don't you hear all of the accusations? Like, say something. And it says here, Pilate is amazed. How many hundreds of convicts, how many hundreds of prisoners has Pilate interrogated before? And they all had the same story. I didn't do it, Your Honor. Right? There are no guilty people on death row. How many times had he interviewed people and they all gave some variation of, no, 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 it was a misunderstanding, or I didn't do it, or, or I did do it, but please, I'm begging for mercy. But never in his life has he seen this. This man doesn't try to defend his innocence, doesn't beg for mercy, doesn't answer his accusations. And every prisoner who has ever stood before Pilate is scratching their head. And it's not just prisoners, isn't it? How many of us are in the PPA? Anybody in People Pleaser Anonymous? Am I the only card-carrying member? <laughs> you look at this situation and you're like, I don't understand. How can someone stand in the face of accusations and not try to defend themselves? Man, I am a card-carrying member of the PPA. I don't need to be on death row to feel like I need to defend myself, right? The, the slightest accusation, the slightest hint of critique, there's just something inside of me that says, I want people to think well of me, and, I, and so I rise up, and I have to defend, or I have to explain, or I have to, no, no, you have to understand. i got to justify, and there's, because there's nothing worse than someone thinking badly of you, especially if it's wrong especially if it's a lie, especially if it's based on a, on a rumor. Am I right? This is for visual effect. <laughs> I'm going to let you think about that one, all right? The PPA, we get into a defensive posture at the slightest critique. And yet here, I just, I can't help but be amazed. They thought poorly of Jesus. You're not alone. They talked bad about Jesus, Behind his back and in front of his back and on the side. You're not alone. Jesus was misunderstood. He was mislabeled. He was unfairly accused. And yet Jesus doesn't have a defensive bone in his body. He doesn't respond out of insecurity, even in the face of death. So that's what you say. Maybe be more like Jesus, amen? Amen. Oh, Lord, cure me of my insecurity and defensiveness. And so Pilate has never seen anything like this. A man facing accusation in silence, making no moves to defend himself. And it's as if, it's, it's as if this Jesus, it's as if he wants to die. It's almost like if Pilate didn't know any better, it's like as if this Jesus was just embracing death. Why? Why not defend himself? Why accept death without objection? Well, the next scene makes it very clear. Look at verse 6 with me. It says, Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. A man deserving of death is given new life. Pilate leaves the courtroom. The sun is up. And people are already congregating outside of Pilate's headquarters. And so you may recall that the holiday week is underway, right? And so people are off from work, and I don't know about you, but do you guys have favorite holiday traditions, right? How many, how many of your traditions involve food, right? Next week, how many of you will make some hams, right? Some turkeys, maybe? I grew up Puerto Rican, so we make a nice pork shoulder, beni, right? My first time I had Thanksgiving with my wife, and I was like, where's the rice and beans? She's like, 
we don't do rice and beans for Thanksgiving. I was like, everybody does rice and beans for Thanksgiving. Not everybody does rice and beans for Thanksgiving. I'm now on the record, okay? And so I love my traditions. Well, they had one of their favorite holiday traditions. Every year at this time on the holidays, Pilate would release a prisoner. You guys aren't liking that? That tradition there? You're not feeling that one? All right. We're going to scratch next week's illustration, okay? So every year they would come together and they would cry out to Pilate, 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 release the prisoner, prisoner, release the prisoner, prisoner. You see, this was their tradition. Pilate, this was a pretty good political move. In order to keep the, the crowds and the masses appeased, in order to keep them from getting too feisty, he would release back to them one of their own prisoners, whoever they asked for. And so as the crowd is standing outside of his palace, as they're standing, as he comes onto the balcony, an idea comes to his mind. You see, Pilate's no dum-dum, okay? And Pilate can tell there's something fishy going on here. Pilate can tell that there's something shady happening, and, and so he, he's, he's not sure. Maybe this is some local religious politics. Maybe there's some religious territorialism going on, but it's, it's pretty clear Jesus is not the rabble-rouser that they claim him to be. This must be more about their hearts than it is about his guilt. He says, I think their motivation for wanting him dead is envy. And so Pilate, as the crowd chants for their tradition, he realizes maybe I can circumvent the council by appealing to the crowd. And so they're asking, release the prisoner! And he goes, I have an idea. How about, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? Here's how I'm going to get around the council. Hey, crowd, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And you're like, yes, brilliant move. Except we see that the council members, they're not only working the courts, they're working the crowd. And they're slithering through the crowd, and they're, and they're lathering them up into, into a fury, and they're saying, no, ask, ask for the other guy. Ask for, come on, let's, hey, we want the other guy. Yeah, we want the other guy. And they, and they get the crowd all riled up. And it says here, and among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. Now, I don't, I don't know much about Barabbas. I've never met him. I wasn't there, and so I had to do what anybody does. I looked him up online, and I found his Instagram profile. And this is a dude that you don't want your children around. It wasn't a private profile, but it should have been. This is a man who, if he moves into your neighborhood, he's going to show up on some sort of list, okay? Because this is a dangerous dude. You see, he was a freedom fighter. He hated that Israel was under Roman occupation. So this is the kind of guy who's going around town, and he's starting riots. He's smashing windows. He's working people up into a mob. He's having secret meetings in basements that are no good, you know? And, and in the last insurrection, he murdered someone cold blood or hot blood. He was probably angry. He murders someone. And remember, Rome has no tolerance for these freedom fighters. So he's now arrested. He's going to be crucified. He's a murderer, a rebel, an insurrectionist. Violence is left in his wake. And don't do that. Stop it. I see your face right now and you kind of have this smug, don't look down your nose at Barabbas. Don't you dare be disgusted by my boy here. Because if there was an Instagram account for your spiritual life, what would it look like? If there was a profile created with pictures of your indiscretions, with descriptions of your guilt, known and unknown, public and private, would you fare much better than Barabbas? If somebody had the ability to scroll through your spiritual life, to scroll through the hidden parts of your life and see them, Hashtag no filter. You feeling pretty good about that? Murder, rebel, insurrectionist. And this is the man they ask for. This is the one that they want left onto the streets. This is the man they want to see walking free. This is the man they want to see released from his prison cell while at the same time demanding that Jesus be crucified. Let the guilty man walk free. Kill Jesus instead. Let the guilty man walk free. Kill Jesus instead. Let the guilty man walk free. Kill Jesus instead. And if you're tuned in right now to the story, you are shocked. After looking at this profile, you are flabbergasted. And you know what? So is Pilate. 
Pilate is so confused. He is so shook in this moment that, that he actually breaks character and he responds. He goes, wait, wait, what? Why? What has this man done to deserve death? What evil has he done? And, and notice the irony. The judge, the governor, is so perplexed that he now takes the position of defense attorney. Wait, wait, why? I, I just, I gotta, this is so baffling. You gotta explain this to me. Break this down for, why are we letting the innocent man go free and killing the, the innocent, letting the guilty man go free and killing the innocent man? Why? Pilate's just so confused by this plan. But they shout all the more, crucify him. Let the guilty walk free. Kill Jesus instead. Kill Jesus instead. Hey, kill Jesus instead. So their minds were made up. And so it says, so he released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And as the crack of the whip sounds on his back, as Jesus is limped away to be crucified, you can imagine Pilate just shaking his head as he sees a murderer walking free and Jesus walking toward an undeserved death. Why? He's never seen anything like this. He is amazed by their plan. Their plan is to kill an innocent man and let a guilty one walk free. Their plan is to exchange a man who is undeserving of death for a man who is undeserving of life. Their plan is to trade a good man for a guilty one. And it's a staggering plan. But here's what's wild. It's not their plan. It's not their plan. Whose plan is it? It's Jesus' plan. This is not the brainchild of the high priest. This is the plan that existed in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. Pilate is standing over this crowd, confused by the plan, and little does he know, the man who's limping away toward the cross, it's actually his plan. Jesus walked toward death, so the guilty could walk in life. You see, friends, this prisoner exchange, this is Jesus' last parable. This scene here is the final object lesson. This is Jesus' swan song. This is the perfect illustration of what he came to do. You cannot capture the essence of his mission more succinctly than in this picture. He came to take the place of guilty men so that guilty men could walk free. And as he limps away toward a cross, we realize Jesus walked toward death so the guilty could walk in life. This is a snapshot of the gospel. And as we see this scene unfold, as we're sitting here going, why? We, we realize we are Barabbas, aren't we? Sure, we haven't murdered anyone. Sure, our pictures of our indiscretion might look different. I get it. But friends, can we just keep it real? We all fall short in countless ways. We are all like Barabbas, contributing to the brokenness of this world. We are all like Barabbas, contributing to the brokenness of relationships. We lie. We cheat. We steal. We put others' needs before our own. We objectify others for our pleasure. We rage in anger, all while expecting other people to treat us with grace and kindness. Like, no, don't you get it? We all fall short. We are more like Barabbas than we wish to realize. And on the other side of the podium stands Jesus Christ, who is completely different. This is a Jesus who knew no sin. This is a man who lived a perfect life. He racked up righteousness in his own account. He's the only dude in human history that can look before God and stand before him and say, I deserve your love and affection and acceptance because I've never failed your standard. What? Where we have fallen, he has never failed. Where the first Adam fell in the garden to temptation, Jesus stood and said, no, every way that you've been tempted, Jesus can empathize. He understands. He was tempted just like you, but he never failed once. And in a stunning move of selfless and sacrificial love, he willingly 
takes our place. He willingly gifts us as a gift of grace, his record, his reward, his righteousness. He goes, Father, the way that you would treat me, here's my brother, he's with me. He's in Christ. My sister here, treat her the way that you would treat me. She is in Christ. And when we turn from our lifestyle, when we say, you know, I'm tired of trying to be my own king. I'm tired of trying to to do my own thing and and follow what I think is right. I'm going to turn. The Bible calls that repentance. I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn and follow this Jesus who loved me so much that he gave his life for me. And in that moment, he changes your life. Can we go back and revisit your spiritual Instagram? He changes your identity. You are now a child of God. And he has replaced those pictures of violence and sin and division and strife and anxiety and weakness and turmoil. And he has replaced them. When God looks at you, your bio reads, child of God, loved by the Father, righteous, filled with the Spirit, set apart for him, free. You are clean. God doesn't treat you the way that you deserve to be treated. Amen, somebody. Because I'm in Christ, I don't have my just desserts. And as we see this powerful transformation, as we see this great exchange, our amazed response is the same as Pilate's. Why? Wait, wait, what? Why? Why would anybody do this for you? Why why would any, what? And the answer is as simple as the verse that we all know, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. God is so filled with love and compassion and grace and mercy that he was compelled on a rescue mission to save the Barabbases of this world and to bring them into the family of God. Jesus walked toward death so the guilty could walk in life. An hour later, your guard shows up But he's not carrying your morning slop. He fumbles with the keys in his pocket and he unlocks your cell and releases your bonds. You're stunned as the guard who has beaten you countless times says, you're free to go. You stumble out of your cell thinking this is too good to be true. And as you walk down the hall toward freedom, you see another man walking in the opposite direction. You dare one last glance over your shoulder and you see him entering a cell, your cell. You risk a question to your captor and you ask about this man and he just grunts, a prisoner exchange. Enjoy your freedom, Barabbas. Jesus walked toward death so the guilty could walk in life. Are you walking in life, friend? Are you walking in the life that God designed for humanity to experience? Or are you still walking your way? Are you still dancing to the tune of a culture and of a worldview that says, you do you, boo-boo. You will be happiest when you listen to your heart, wherever it leads you. Are you still following that life, that dead ends in death? How's that working out for you? Are you still living a life marked by futility and anxiety and weakness and and, and just that, that separation from God that you can't shake. Jesus died so that we can walk in life, so that we can turn and follow him, live in his family, be known and know him. Are you walking in life? You see, this, this very simple message that I shared with you this morning, it's called the gospel, which means good news. This is the good news that changes everything. And maybe you're here and, and you thought this whole like Jesus thing was just about like religiousness and do-gooderism, you know, just like, you know, go to church and like try to clean up your act. That's what it's all about. And friends, you could not be wronger. The message of the gospel is what I shared with you this morning, that Jesus walked toward death so that the guilty could walk in life. And he calls you to follow him. And so I've heard it said once, and I want to share it with you. Responding to this message is as simple as A, B, C. Number one. No, that's wrong. Letter A, right? A stands for admit. Do you admit that you're more like Barabbas than you care to admit? 
See, there was a time in my life where I did not admit this. There was a time in my life where I was pretty self-righteous. And I think, I'm pretty good. I'm all right. Okay? I'm, I, I, I go to church. I do the traditions. I, I'm pretty good. I just needed Jesus to give me a boost. I was not admitting my need. I was just asking for a little assistance. And the Lord helped me understand that I had a better chance of sopping up the ocean with a sponge than I did of making myself right before the Father. I had a better chance of shoveling the ocean out with a teaspoon than I did making myself right before God. Do you admit, is there, is there an honest, humble posture in your heart that you goes, yeah, I'm not going to lie. I'm not right with God. You admit. And then it says it's as easy as be. You believe. Do you dare to believe that in spite of who you are, Jesus loves you anyway? Do you dare to believe that this man really did come from heaven, die, raise up on the third day, and ascend to heaven? Do you believe that he can do for you what he said he would and extend his grace and mercy to you to bring you into his family? No way. I can't believe that, man. I'm too far gone, man. You don't even know my story. Do you believe that his grace is greater than your sin? Do you believe that his reach goes further than your ability to run? If you believe that, that's called faith. That's the biblical word for faith. I trust, I believe that Jesus can do this for me. And then C stands for confess. Have you confessed him as Lord? Have you declared with your mouth publicly to your world in front of your people? Have you declared, I confess, I'm a follower of Jesus? I confess him as Lord. He's my master. I now take my cues from him. Will I fall? Oh, yeah. As soon as I leave the parking lot, <laughs> I'll fall. But I'm going to get back up and follow him. ABC. And so maybe you're here this morning and you've never, like you've never understood this. You've never even done this in your life. You've never had a moment in your life where you said, I want to ABC. I need Jesus to save me. Well, I'm excited for you because we're going to pray in a moment. And this is your day. This is your moment. This is your season. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Father in heaven, man, what good news this is, God. We live in a world that tells us that we need to be better, try harder, do more to try to just shake that feeling of failure. But Lord, here we stand in front of this message. And we hear you saying, that you have done what we could not. That you empower us to do what you've called us to do. And so, Lord, we admit we are not good enough. God, I admit, like we said earlier with the psalmist, I'm a sinner. The things I don't want to do, I do. The things I do want to do, I don't. God, there is sin inside of me. I, I was conceived in sin. And so, God, no pretense before you. We keep it real. We admit that we are fallen. And yet, Lord, we believe, we dare to believe that you are more loving than we could ever imagine or hope for. We dare to believe that that simple faith in Jesus will save us. We dare to believe that you really do love us, even though we have nothing to bring to the table. And, Lord, that love compels us to confess you as Lord. You are our Lord. You are our master. No turning back. We will make you the priority of our life and follow you. So would you change us, Lord? Fill us with your spirit. Change our identity. Give us a fresh start. Forgive us. Give us new spiritual family. Give us a new purpose as we follow you. And Father, for all of my friends who are praying this prayer for the first time, who are filled with faith, who are filled with longing and hope for you, would you meet them? Embed them into spiritual family. Bring alongside of them mature believers who can bring them under their wing and teach them how to follow Jesus with every aspect of their lives. Lord, you are our God. This was your plan, and we love you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.